Consciousness, the biggest mystery of the universe. The fact that you, at this very moment, are matter that has become aware of itself. At Room for Discussion, we often concern ourselves within the social sciences, economics, business and politics. But today, we will turn the conversation on ourselves. Instead of focusing on the structure of our societies, we focus on animals to understand the animals that engage within our societies, humans. Today, we will be speaking with Professor of Primate Behavior, Frans de Waal, in order to get back to our roots. We'll be talking about our primate cousins. What can we learn from them? And we will also touch upon our most basic topics, free will, the evolution of culture, and understanding human behavior. Good afternoon, Professor. How are you holding up during this pandemic? Well, I'm cooped up here. So uh, we are in quarantine, even though we have a governor who doesn't believe in it. But um, yeah, we are doing that. Has it been enjoyable for you to stay home or uh, not so much? No, I have a beautiful home. So um, that part is fine. We have a garden and a home. Yeah. But it is, it's getting a bit boring. <laughs> we can imagine. We can imagine. So. You're, you're, of course, a professor of, of, of primate behavior. You're also the director of the Living Links uh, Institute. You are the author of multiple books. And we were wondering, for you, what does a, a, a normal day in your life look like? Well, I'm retired. So the normal day in my life is very quiet now. But I used to, <laughs> I used to have a, a team of about 20 people and a lot of primates that I worked with. So... Uh, yeah, we, we did a lot of, um, in, in the summertime, especially this time, would be the time that we do most of the research. Because in the, of course, in the other time, we would also teach and things like that. Yeah. yeah. And what is, um, we kind of want to jump immediately into the uh, primates, pretty much. Uh, because we were reading some of your work, we've been kind of doing it for the past three weeks to uh, also spend our time uh, during the quarantine. And we came up to this thing that you talk about, which is anthropodenial which I think is this inability to see the animal within ourselves and then also the human within animals. Which one do you think is the larger problem? The inability to see the human in other animals or the animals within ourselves as humans? Well, anthropodenial is a term that I invented because we always get accused of anthropomorphism. So, so as soon as you say, uh, let's say my dog is jealous, uh, people would say, oh, you shouldn't say such things because... That's anthropomorphic because you're, you're applying human mm -hmm. terminology to your dog, and obviously your dog is something else than a human. Um, and that was used so often to kill off any argument about animal emotions and animal intelligence that I invented the term anthropodenial to say, well, the, the opposite problem is that you don't see the connection. There, there is a connection between you and a dog because we're both mammals and we both have emotions and we do both express the emotions. So if you don't want to see these connections, you're an anthropodenial. And, and I think anthropodenial is actually the bigger problem, uh, especially in Western science, Western science and philosophy. So the philosophers and the anthropologists and many psychologists, they still believe that we humans are not animals. We humans are something else than animals. I don't know, as a biologist, I wonder what we are if we're not animals, but that's what they will say. And uh, that has been maintained for 2,000 years or more, that we are something separate. And uh, that has created a host of problems. So, so actually, the problems we have today, the COVID crisis, the climate crisis, these are problems created by the mindset of the West, Western man, so to speak, the mindset that we are something else than we are we're separate from nature. We can so do whatever we what's want. What's this explicit connection between COVID-19? How would you relate that exactly to the inability? Well, we, we, have, we have eaten bats, for one thing. <laughs> we, we eat wildlife. Uh, we, we mix up wildlife. In, in the agricultural industry, we put tons of antibiotics in pigs. Um, we do all sorts of things with nature that we shouldn't be doing. And um, the COVID crisis is partly a crisis of uh, wildlife eating and wildlife mismanagement and not respecting the boundaries between, um, between humans and other species. Okay, we want to... What is happening? It, it, all, it, all, it all connects to the same issue, is that we, we think we're something else than nature, we're separate from nature, and we are not separate from nature. Okay, before maybe coming back to uh, the COVID-19 crisis later in the, the interview, we want to talk about consciousness for, uh, for a bit. So there are some scientists who argue that 
um, animals lack a theory of mind. So they are not able to infer um, or actually see the emotional state of another individual. And we were wondering, how do you see this? Can, can, can you see chimps and bonobos be aware of their reality? Yeah, th those are all separate questions. Of course they're aware of their reality. Every animal is aware of its reality. Um, but what you mean is, is whether they have empathy, they're sensitive to the emotions of others, because theory of mind is, is something else. Theory of mind is that you understand the intentions and the knowledge of somebody else. And interestingly enough, the, the term theory of mind came out of chimpanzee research in the 70s. Then for a while, people said, well, maybe it comes from chimpanzees, but uh, they don't have it, unfortunately. Um, and now we have, in the last few years, we have again experiments, again demonstrating that chimpanzees do have it. So theory of mind, which is understanding the intentions and knowledge of others, I think it, that's not an issue anymore. I think we, we, we know that the apes have that. Empathy is something, something else. Empath for me, empathy is much more basic. Empathy is that you're sensitive to the emotions of somebody else and you're affected by the emotions of somebody else. And empathy is found at that level in all sorts of mammals. So, so your dog has empathy. Your dog empathizes with your feelings, feels happy when you're happy, feels sad when you're sad. So, so that, that level of empathy, which we call emotional contagion or emotional sensitivity, is very widespread, I think. But can you say something about, the about how the animals actually experience these emotions? Ah, th then you're talking about the feelings. Mm -hmm. And the feelings we don't know. So um, I, I keep feeling separate from emotion because feelings are private states. And um, feelings are inaccessible, but also your feelings. You, you can tell me that you're sad or that at, at the moment you're very happy, maybe. Um, I cannot feel what you feel. So your feelings are also inaccessible. You can talk about them and I can, uh, maybe I believe you, maybe I, you can also be a zombie. I don't know what you are. You're on a screen. A digital screen so who knows what you are you you could be an artifact but um i'm willing to believe you so feelings is more based on communication language communication and um in of course in human research we very often conflate the two in, in humans we, we we talk about feelings and emotions as if they are the same things but for me they are separate things okay and when because once you said that uh if you've said in an interview you read that um there's a that the fact that be, that animals are emotional beings that that has moral consequences for how we treat yeah. and uh, for how we treat animals, but we were wondering, isn't knowing how they experience these emotions or if they are really consciously experience these emotions necessary to make the link between an emotional animal and uh, a moral consequence to that? Yeah, if if we assume that they have emotions and express emotions, which they do all the time. If we assume that they have them without associated feelings, then of course we can do with the animals or whatever we want. So um, let's say you, you slaughter a pig and the pig squeals and, and you would argue like they did and Descartes has argued these, these kind of things. And you would argue, well, the pig squeals, but that doesn't mean anything. doesn't mean that he feels anything. If if that's the argument you want to follow, yeah, then then there are no moral consequences. But my sense is that if animals have emotions and they express them and they express them very similar to us, especially the apes, then the feeling states are probably very similar too. That would it would not make much sense that they would not feel anything. So so the the argument that they don't feel has been made even for children. So for for human babies, so human babies until the 1980s. People said they feel no pain. And so uh, surgical procedures like, like circumcision and whatever, they were done on babies without anesthesia because babies have no pain. Now we think differently about that, but that mindset that you can have all these emotional expressions of crying in the case of a baby, the baby would be crying and they would say, well, maybe, maybe it's crying, but it doesn't mean it feels anything. Uh, that, that mindset is completely gone now. And I think it has to be gone for animals as well. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, we have that debate in the fish in the fish industry. So, the, the, and in in Dutch also the hengelaars, the, the 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 people who fish, they they will argue that the fish don't feel pain. But I think that argument has been settled, and they do feel pain. Okay, and when we when we talk about uh, certain uh, abilities that uh, that humans have and animals actually don't have, so for example, you once said that man is really unique because of language, of the ability to practice language. Um, when we look to animals, which which animal behavior comes closest actually to to human language and and human planning capacities? Yeah, well, planning is something else. Pl planning you can do without language. A and we have lots of evidence for planning without language in, in other species. Language, if you take it as a learned symbolic communication, so the, the symbols, we are not born with the symbols. So, so you, you speak Dutch, uh, someone speaks Chinese, that's all learned symbols. Um, th that is unique. I, I think the, the symbolic communication is unique and that it is learned is unique, and that we put all, all these things together in a grammar, so it has a structure, a syntactic structure. All of that is very special, I think. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are not many elements in human language that we cannot find in other species. So, so more and more we discover that actually many of these elements of human language can be found in other species, but the way we put it together is pretty unique. So I consider language a uniquely human capacity, Communication in general is, of course, not uniquely human. There's many animals who are very good at communicating things and, and sometimes very complex and sometimes we don't understand. So there was recently an experiment with dolphins who had to solve a cooperative task. And they noticed that the sound, because the dolphins, is a hydrophone, you can hear, hear the dolphins underwater. The, dolphin changed, the dolphins changed their communication during the task. So now no one knows what they're exactly saying to each other, but Maybe they say, put the screw there or whatever. You, you don't, don't know what they're saying. So uh, um, there is probably more complex communication going on there in orcas and dolphins and maybe elephants, some, some species that we have no clue about. Okay. But if you, sorry, if you look at a, like a chimp, for instance, let's say a reactive behavior when you're growing up, if maybe a baby chimp does something that the older chimp does not like and it reacts with aggression, right? Technically, the chimp will learn to attach a symbol or a meaning to the sign of aggression, right? Is that not a form of language, very preliminarily, though? Yeah, they, they do that kind of things all the time, that they, they make clear to each other how they feel about certain things and approve or disapprove of certain behavior. And so they associate punishments or rewards with certain behavior. So all, all these things are done. It's, that's not exactly language for me, but yeah, all these processes take place. And when we take all these abilities that animals have when we take that together so some sort of communication uh, some sort of planning maybe could we then actually conclude that uh, that apes or or animals in general have some sort of culture maybe yeah that's actually a, that's a whole field animal culture is a, is yeah. a big field um it started in the 1950s with a, a japanese scientist imanishi who uh this was at the time that the anthropologists were saying Culture is what makes us human. That's what, that was the saying in anthropology. Culture is what makes us human. And so the anthropologists had no room for animals because if culture is what makes us human, then obviously animals can't have it. But Imanishi in Japan, who was also an anthropologist, he, he wrote a, a tiny little book. And in the book, he had a discussion between a monkey and a wasp and a human. And they were discussing what would happen if we would learn from each other. And, and so, uh, the monkey would say, well, if you can learn from others, then this group will have different behavior than that group because these guys have learned this kind of things and these have the And so maybe we should call it different cultures. And so he was speculating at that time. And then within a couple of years, his students who worked in Japan with the Japanese macaques, they discovered potato washing. So they discovered they were handing out potatoes to the monkeys. And the monkeys would immediately take them to a stream and rub all the sand off and before they would eat them. And discovered a monkey named Emo, a female. And from Emo, it spread to other females and then to other males and to, then to the whole group. And so the, the Japanese started speaking of a tradition. They say Emo has started a tradition of washing your potatoes before you eat them. And um, that has been studied extensively and became sort of the 
the prototype of culture. And now we have all these studies on dolphins and whales and chimpanzees and orangutans. All sorts of animals have cultures. And some of them have much more than just this potato washing. They have many different layers of culture. And, and so we, we, are, we are learning more and more about it. And so animal culture has become a big topic. And it's not just limited to the primates. Um, there are even fish studies now on culture, on, on the, how fish learn from each other, what to eat and what not to eat and things like that. So I guess the concern that we have is, can you extrapolate those differences that we see across, for instance, primates in regards to culture? So if you were to go to a different area, you might see primates act in a different way, even though they're part of the same species, but that might be environmentally induced as well. Maybe there's just a slightly different environmental situation they're in yeah. that calls for a different culture. With those rules, can we actually extend that to human beings as well? Is the same logic that creates culture among primates, fish, the same rudimentary behaviors that create differences in culture among humans? Yeah, in humans, of course, we, we have cultures. The environment and culture are very hard to separate. Because uh, obviously, if you, if you live on the North Pole versus the Sahara, you have to have a different culture of how you do things or what you eat and how you live. And so that people in these different regions have different cultures is, is partly environmentally induced. But it's also partly based on them learning from others of how to do things. And so we have that same problem as the primates, is that um, accepting captivity, where you can create the same conditions and you can say, and, and we, we do that kind of things. We, we, we sometimes have these experiments where we have one group of primates in the same conditions, ex exactly the same as the others. And in one, we induce a, a tradition. So for example, we did experiments with chimpanzees where we train one chimpanzee to, chimpanzee to open a box in a particular way and another, and that box has, has a second way of opening it. And then we, we have two different groups who do it in two different ways. And then you have the same environment. So you can keep the environment constant, but in the wild, of course, that's not a possibility. We, we, we have to face these environmental variations there. Um, I think we'll talk about uh, morality for a moment, right? Yeah, so here's the concern I have, because if you look at cultural differences, and you don't want to go into geodeterminism by any means, but for instance, you have the difference between like an honor culture or, for instance, a more liberal culture, and you can tie that to the environment that human beings are operating in. Now, we were looking at some of your work, and I think you said that science, we can't really use science to answer moral questions. But if you look at primates and ape behavior, you can kind of say, we can see altruism there, we can see tit-for-tat behavior. And when we learn more about the differences across cultures, across humans, I think you lagged out. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You were frozen for a second, yeah. Yeah, so the concern I have, well, the question I basically have about it is, knowing that we can basically make analyses of moral behavior across chimpanzees or primates in general, why can't we make that same extension among humans? That's the real kind of extrapolation that I'm not too sure about. You mean that if, if let's say, chimpanzees have compassion or empathy, and, and that's part of their culture, that we can extrapolate that to humans? Yeah, in, in the same way that you can look at a, a troop of, I guess, chimpanzees and say, okay, that ape is technically acting moral or not selfish, right? But then if you can do that about apes, why can't we do the same thing about humans, right? Couldn't we look at it, I guess, a human society and say that's amoral and then draw the rules respectively for that? The, the thing is that the, the proposal to use science for moral decision making came from Sam Harris. Sam okay. Harris was, yeah, he, he, he's an atheist, a rabbit atheist. And, and I've had my disagreements with, with atheists in the U.S. because you know, in, in the Netherlands, half the people are atheists and no one worries yeah. much about it. But in the U.S., atheism is a big thing and you have to fight for it and things like that. And so the atheists are sort of um, radicalized here. And so Sam Harris said, why, why don't we leave moral decision making to the scientists and, and have science make the decisions for us? And I don't trust scientists personally. I, I'm, I'm a scientist. I don't trust scientists with making the moral decisions. Scientists have made far too many immoral decisions. Uh, so, for example, eugenics is a science. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, 
and I don't think it was a particularly moral science. And so um, we scientists, we do whatever we are asked to do. We, we will make a nuclear bomb. If you want a nuclear bomb, we will make it. We don't worry too much about um, the moral implications or the political implications of these things. And so science for me, for science to tell us how we should live our lives, because that's basically what you then say, um, I don't trust them enough for that. But then and so that's why I trust? said we, should, we, can, we cannot leave it. Huh? So where what? do we get these answers from for complex morality in any case, if it can't be the scientists? It's a consensus in the society. The society as a whole needs to come to a consensus. Do we accept abortion or don't we accept abortion? I don't want to have a scientist answer that question because the scientist will say whether abortion is effective or ineffective or should be applied or not. Uh, biologically speaking, the scientist cannot make the moral decision, it can inform it, we, we can provide evidence and, and information, but I don't think the, the moral decision itself is up to the scientists. Okay, when we talk about morality, we talk, of course, about what, what, what is fairness, what is a good, what would be a good action to do in a certain situation. And you wrote a book, which is called uh, Good Natured, in which you talk about morality sort of grounded in, in, in biology. And we were talking, we were, we were actually thinking, like, rather than talking about whether animals and, and humans are sort of naturally bad or naturally good, couldn't we see just see goodness as, as one of the many desires that we have, which also can be overruled by other desires or structures? Yeah, yeah. Good nature was was written in response to the idea that um, what we get from nature is only bad. And uh, at the moment, you have the book by uh, uh, Rutger Bregman, which which is basically making that same argument that I make in Good Nature which is that we're not as bad as you might think. Um, and and I, I think that whole view that we deep down, we are selfish and competitive. And um, that's what we get from nature, the struggle for life and so on, is, a, is an erroneous idea because we get all the positive things like empathy and cooperation, we also get from nature. And so we, get, we, we got the whole package and which one we emphasize in society is up to us, I think. And, and that's not a necessarily a biological dictate that is more like something that we need to decide in society do we want to for example in this society at the moment do we want to be racist or don't we want to be racist and we need to decide that as a, as a society um even though for example parts of racism are, are of course biological in the sense xenophobia and not liking strangers is something that many animals have and many humans have and, but then if you make a mixed society in which many sorts of people live together, you have to come to grips with that. And so um, there's a, always a biological component to everything, but then there is a cultural and moral and social component that is that complicates things. Yeah, so on this, because you just mentioned racism, and I think tribalism is the clearest thing that we always talk about. So if you look at certain countries, people will be more willing to donate, do philanthropy, if they feel like the citizens, the people in the actual country are part of their population. So you have this dichotomy where we're more generous for people that are in the in-group at the cost of people at the out-group. So is there any way you can structure society so that we still play onto these kind of animalistic impulses to do good, to be generous, while at the same time preventing the selfish behavior that makes us not want to give to people that are not like us? Yeah, the, the way to do that, I think, is, is the opposite of de dehumanization, is to humanize uh, the others. So, so I know that, for example, they're trying that between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I don't think they're partic particularly successful with it, but they're trying to make them show that the life of the Palestinians, to the, show to the Israelis that the life of the Palestinians is not so different from their life, to make that connection. So what you, what you do is you make clear that you, um, that you understand that these, these people that you see as others are actually very similar to yourself. So it's the opposite of dehumanization. I think that's the best strategy to, to get rid of tribalism. And so on another animalistic impulse, if you take like obesity in the United States, right? So it's a very animalistic impulse to gorge yourself for sugar, fat, uh, you know, salt, all of the, all the good stuff. Do you think there's a certain benefit to actually going back to our evolutionary roots when it comes to policymaking, knowing that we're victims of these animalistic urges to structure society so that we don't fall victim of them? And how would you how would you do that? I'm thinking maybe so 
a big one would be the nudges by Richard Thaler. So he says, for instance, if people are very addicted to sugar, right? We, we love sugar. We love eating sugary cereal. What a government could do is they could put the sugary cereal boxes at the bottom of the row in a supermarket at the exception of maybe like, you know, Weetabix, something healthier, right? Which is a small nudge, which is kind of playing at our, I would say, animalistic behavior that can sometimes produce bad results for us. Yeah, I know. That, that sounds like a, a great idea yeah. is to, to make it a little bit harder. Yeah, put them out of reach maybe even. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I guess this would also tie into your thing about the anthropo denial, that it actually would be useful for policymakers to think, you know, these are all the mistakes, well, not mistakes, but animalistic urges that we have. Let's maybe put some structures in place so that we don't completely fall victim to that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, when we're looking at social sciences, as we're, as we're discussing right now, do you think that in general, also, if we are looking to the fields of psychology and the fields of uh, anthropology, that they should look more into, actually into biology to, to actually understand human behavior rather than focusing on social constructs? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so the psychology is, of course, already doing that. So I, I'm, a, I'm a biologist, but I've been 25 years a professor in psychology. And um, when I came into psychology in the beginning, they were very um, human focused and humans were very special for them. But then the influx of neuroscience came in psychology. And so in, in neuroscience is big now in psychology. In every psychology department, one third of the professors is neuroscientists. And the neuroscientists, of course, they tell you that the rat brain and the human brain work in the same way. That's why you can do research on rats that helps humans. And so um, the neuroscientists are often biologists, and for the biologists, the humans are just animals. So, so, so uh, the neuroscientists bring in that line of thinking, and so the psychologists are changing their minds on this. The anthropologists still live in a different universe. The, the anthropologists ha have meetings still today uh, about how special humans are. They have literally meanings that say uh, the human success story or um, a special species or whatever they, they call it. So how come? And so the, huh? How does that still happen? The anthropologists are still very much focused on humans as something absolutely unique. That's why they don't want to hear about animal culture. Uh, and that's why they don't want to hear about all the connections. Um, and so um, th that is a leftover of, of the old philosophical thinking, I think. So the social sciences are changing especially in psychology. And what enabled that change? Is it mainly technology, sort of our, our ability to research in a more complex way? No, I think it's the connection with neuroscience, which gives the connection with biology. And so as soon as you, you discover a certain mechanism in the human brain, that, let's say, that, that let us solve certain problems, you wonder about the evolution of that mechanism. Where does, where does that part of the brain come from? What does it normally do in other species? And then we start exploring you automatically get the evolutionary question. You automatically get the mechanistic question. You make the connection with rats and with monkeys. And before you know it, you have placed humans in a biological context. And that's what psychology is doing. And the psychologists are perfectly happy with that nowadays. And so that, that whole division that they used to have, I think, has, has, has worn a little bit. But uh, yeah, there, there are other fields where that's not the case. Yeah, so I'm wondering, because you, you were in academia, if you have any idea on a healthy relationship to develop this, because at the same time, it would be beneficial for social scientists to kind of go away from that blank slate kind of philosophy, understand that human beings have biological urges. But I also understand the concern that you're entering dangerous territory for, for instance, you mentioned epigenetics. Like Charles Murray, who's a very controversial individual, talks about how biology and genetic study will be the revolution for social sciences, right? So how at the same time, can you, I guess, develop this healthy understanding that human beings are, I wouldn't say automatons, but definitely more, I would say, animalistic and understandable, but then do it in a healthy manner where we're not drawing, I guess, wide swaths and generalizations about populations. Yeah, Mur Murray, that's not epigenetics. That yeah, is yeah. eugenics. Eugenics, sorry, sorry. Eugen. Yeah. Yeah. Epigenetics is it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a bad. Time. <laughs> eugenics. Uh, yeah, uh, eugenics is, of course, horrible. And, and, and the reason, actually, we talked about anthropology. The reason anthropologists have run away from biology is partly because um, they got into eugenics. Uh, the, the German anthropologists, exactly. especially 
are very, very allergic. They're very allergic to, to biology because they have such a bad history with biology. And yeah. so yeah, gen eugenics is a, is a real big danger. If people simplify biology and then apply it to humans and say, well, uh, humans of different races, they have different intelligence. That's the sort of story of Murray. Yeah, then then we need to fight it with biological arguments. And that's yeah. what, what many people are doing. Yeah. So, so not, with, not with social arguments or with ideological arguments, but just on the basis of biology, it doesn't really compute that whole thing. Yeah, so avoiding the race discussion and focusing on something that's, I guess, is the male, like male-female debate. Right. This is a big, big issue because you do see disparities. You see inequalities between the amount that men and women earn. And some people actually point to biological reasons for that, that these high income earners are just disproportionately men. They work on average higher hours. So I guess, is there any axiom you can apply where you can look at a difference between a man and a woman and say, OK, this is a social construct and then this is biological? Are there any rules for this? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm writing about gender at the moment. Yeah, gender, gender from a primate perspective. Would you like to and elaborate? Of course, in, yeah, in the primates, um, of course, we, we always make the distinction between this is a male gorilla, this is a female gorilla. They do different things. They have different lives. Uh, they act very differently. So, so, so the sex differences for us are very obvious. And, and, and they have all these sex differences that are actually sometimes quite similar to our sex differences without uh, the cultural indoctrination, which feminists say are responsible for this and could you give an example of that of an of an uh, could you give an example of a difference between females and and males in apes that we also see in uh, in humans the the simplest is violence so so you look at human statistics you look at the statistics in the netherlands or wherever any country four out of five homicides is done by men and four out of five victims of homicides are men uh, if you, and, and recently a paper came out, this five years ago, a paper came out on lethal aggression in chimpanzees in the wild. Four out of five is done by males, oh. and four out of five victims is males. So the statistics are extremely similar. So, so that's the most obvious one. Uh, maternal care would be another one. Um, striving for dominance uh, would be another one. Um, th- th- there are many of these uh, sex differences that are similar across the board, that doesn't necessarily justify why men would earn more in, in society yeah. than women. That's a very separate issue for me. And, and of course, uh, uh, as far as earning potential, I don't have any comparison with the primates. That's, yeah. that's up yeah, to yeah. human society yeah. how to dis- and economy to, to decide that, you know? Yeah, I was actually wondering on this because it does seem that there's a lot of these kind of new conservative movements that are trying to hinge on biological explanations. I remember watching this one where he talks about if you look at rhesus monkeys, you can see a difference between male monkeys choosing a toy truck as opposed to a doll and then extrapolating that to why men are more likely to choose things related jobs like STEM research as opposed Mm -hmm. to people related jobs. And that's actually the reason for the income disparity. I, I think that's a way really far stretch to make. But again, like, I know that maybe this is not the position you're in, but how do we approach these controversial topics in academia? I, I really have no clue how you can talk, for instance, and say you can have a reasonable discussion about violence in human societies and then approach it from saying men are just inherently more violent than women. Like, how can we even do that? You, you would never use that as a justification. Yeah. So you, you cannot say that nature made you do this, for example. Yeah. So, so if men are more violent, um, that doesn't mean that it's good to be more violent. Uh, so, so that 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 always yeah. we keep that we call it a naturalistic fallacy. We try to keep that separate. Like like what is your natural tendency and how what we, what do we want from you actually? And and the toy study is interesting because um, what rhesus monkeys have with toy trucks, I really don't understand. I know these experiments. The, the doll part, I can fully understand. So the, the females will pick up dolls more and hold them, uh, just as, as young female primates also li- like to hold the babies of other females, of older females. And in the wild, even this has been observed. It has been observed that chimpanzee females, young females, uh, they will carry a log on the back. And 
guys, but they, they did their own dolls to play with, so to speak. So the doll part I find very easy to understand because it relates to maternal behavior, which the females have very strongly. The truck part uh, of that experiment I've never fully understood because a truck, a plastic truck, is really not something that a rhesus monkey will ever uh, find in the natural environment. Um, I just I'm kind of grappling with this because I, for instance, if I take a politics class, we it is under the assumption that these things are socially constructed to a certain extent and then malleable and changeable. But like for instance, can it actually be useful to a certain extent to know that men? Or like not falling to the naturalistic fallacy, but if you see that the differences in homicide rates among men as opposed to women, how that might actually be useful to tailor society knowing these pre-existing conditions, right? Absolutely. So um, you should not raise your sons the same way as your daughters. Yeah, so how, how would you I, I do see, that? I see sometimes feminist literature who says we should raise boys more like girls. No, boys are not girls. And so boys have these violent tendencies, aggressive tendencies, and they will develop uh, stronger muscles. The upper body strength of man is, there's really very little overlap between the upper body yeah. strength of men yeah. and women. They will be stronger and they will be more violent. So you need to raise your sons with this in mind. Every society needs to come to grips with this issue. You will have these, these guys walking around who are potentially dangerous. So you need to teach, teach them self-discipline and honor and respect for women. You need to teach them all these things. You cannot just treat them as if they are girls because they will not develop as girls. And do apes, and that in the, does, do apes do that in the same way? Do they also raise their boys very differently than their girls, for example? Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of evidence for that. And in addition, um, the young males grow up in the presence of adult males who will make sure that they behave. It's a very important part of the education yeah. is that they, the adult males um, uh, will put put them in line. And uh, if, these, if these adult males are absent, there, there are interesting stories from Africa about um, elephants, for example, because the, the, the male, the bull elephants are often shot for their tusks. So the big males disappear. And then the young males become very rambunctious. And, and the young males, they, they attack people, they attack uh, rhinos, they attack each other, uh, they attack females. And so uh, in the absence of these very domineering males, they become they get out of control, and and so it is very interesting how how this this dynamic works, uh, and so yes, if you ask me about how how you should raise your children, I would say you have to treat boys different than girls. It's okay. not the same thing. But, but like, how exactly? Because I like I'm trying to look for these kind of heuristics to actually apply, because the real danger is that you try to do this and you treat it differently, but then you do it wrong. Right. That, yeah. That's the concern. Like, are there because now let me try this back into before, because you were saying that we shouldn't use science to guide our moral behavior. But at the same time, right now, we need to do use our understanding of how boys and girls are different to impact the way that we raise them as children. Right. So I'm having a hard time. reconciling. How would you, for instance, if you had a son and a daughter, raise them differently? I don't have children, yeah. so I can I can very easily but any guesses? really talk about this issue. <laughs> No, uh, but I, I think it's obvious that you need to treat them differently and that you need to keep in mind that a boy will be a different thing than a girl. Um, that doesn't mean that you erase all sorts of opportunities. So, so that's sometimes the issue is that should we um, direct girls in this direction of, let's say, the, the job that they will, or the discipline or whatever they, they're going to have and boys in that direction? No, I, I don't believe it, it needs to be that structured. Is there, if, if a girl wants to have a job like a mechanic that normally is done by man, that I, yeah. I don't think that's the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is how you behave in society in your social relationships. Yeah. We're going to take a massive U-turn uh, right now, which okay. is we've spoken about primates, about how you know different genetic can lead to different behavioral expressions. And you've done a lot of work on this matter. Can, just a direct answer, free will, it, it doesn't exist, right? I've had this discussion in Amsterdam with uh, Dick Swap, yeah, yeah. Who, uh, who is a big opponent of free will. He doesn't yeah. think there is anything like it. And um, yeah, free will. Free will. You know, there, there was a definition. It's, it's very hard to talk about issues that have no definition. 
and, and no one can define for you. Um, but there was one time a philosopher who came up with a definition of free will. Uh, his name is Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book. The book has a good title. It's called On Bullshit. And so it's a book on bullshit. And uh, in that book, he argued that free will cannot occur in animals, uh, but it occurs in humans uh, when we go against our own wishes. So let's say you have an impulse to do a certain thing or a desire to do a certain thing and you decide, no, I, yeah. I'm going against it. It's not smart to do this. I, I need to think about it and whatever. And that's free will, according to him. And we have now all these experiments on animals that actually show free will in that regard. So, so for example, you, you know the marshmallow test? Yeah. The marshmallow test uh, where you give a kid a marshmallow and you yeah. tell them if you wait, if you wait a few minutes, you get a second one, but you, you should not eat it. And, and so they test that on children. This has been done with the primates. And the primates are just, uh, the, the apes at least, are just as good at it as humans. Wait, so how, do you, you put, how does that work? How do you, you, put a chimpanzee, okay. you put a chimpanzee in a, in a situation where there's a bowl, and, and every 30 seconds, a candy falls into the bowl. The chimp has learned that as soon as he removes the bowl and takes the candies, the flow stops. Okay. okay. So the chimp learns, learns quickly that he has to wait. If he wants more candies, he will have to wait. <laughs> And chimps can wait up to 15 minutes, just like the kids do. And, and if you give them toys, for example, during that time, they are better at waiting. And they play more with the toy than they normally would. So they are distracting themselves, just like kids will in all these circumstances. So if that's the definition of free will, to control your impulses, then uh, some animals have free will. Okay, so because what I'm seeing right now is the definition. It's like a little bit being able to overrule your short-term desires for your long-term interests. But to give another definition, the kind of idea that you're an individual agent that can choose. So we can go back to the beginning of this interview and I'd as much of a chance to ask you a different question as I did another, right? I think yeah. if you're taking this biological perspective, for instance, genetic coding, I think the logic would be is that essentially we're all pretty much programming, just a bunch of if statements that are constantly running and whatever like input you have is gonna spit out a necessary output. I guess that's where the definition of free, using that one, that kind of logic, where would you see free will lie? Well, there's always some, um, we, we know that, we know that you, you take your decisions fairly rapidly in, uh, based on intuition and emotions usually, um, be before you even come completely conscious aware of them. And so you have a sort of, we are very impulse driven even though we, we like to think we're very rational exactly, beings, yeah. we're really much more impulse driven. And, and in that sense, yeah, in that sense, we don't have free will, is that before you know it, within, within a second, you have already made up your mind about something. So uh, in that sense, I agree with Swap, is that um, there's a lot of biology and, and unknown brain mechanisms that go into our decisions that we have little control of. And when talking about the, the conversation with uh, Mr. Swab, uh, he argues that that our behavior and our thoughts are very you know, brain-centered. And you, in that conversation, emphasizes that also the body is very important. Do you think in the future that your views will ever converge? The ones from you and, and Mr. Swab? Yeah, I, I, see, I see that happening already to some degree. Our emotions are very body-based. And they're, they're reflected in the body. And of course, Swap immediately said, but also in the brain. And the brain is directing everything. It's probable. It's possible. It's, it's very hard to separate. The brain is part of the body, of course. And so um, I think we, we sometimes underestimate the body. And we, and we keep it sort of out of, uh, we, we like these neat divisions. You have the brain and the body and the head and the body. Um, but I think all these things are completely connected. Um, and for example, the hormones that are in your body, many of them come from the brain. So, and, 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 and certainly the quantities are directed by the brain. So uh, it's very hard to separate these things. And, but, and how do you then think that your views will really come together? I think that is already happening to some degree. So for example, uh, we have an enormous amount of neurons in our uh, intestinal system. Yeah. They sometimes call it the second brain, you know. Uh, and, and so um, not all the neurons that direct our behavior are sitting up here. So 
thing that we have, I mean, we have the, for example, the microbiome at the moment coming up as a big issue, you know, um, which is also a body brain issue, uh, the connection between the body and the brain. And when we, when we talk about, I mean, there are a lot of rich people who sort of freeze in their, their brain. Right. And then I think you once said that that's maybe a bit like to, to, to say it roughly like bullshit, because you also need the body to, to experience your real self. But that that body is it sort of personalized, or would it be possible to actually, I don't know, create a body which you can then connect to the brain, and then you would be able uh, to again head transplant? Yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> these people who what these people do with their brains, and and these are all men. Women never do this. <laughs> this is a, this is a, a male aberration. Is to think that everything we do is up here, not in the body. And um, they freeze their brains, which is one thing, because then maybe that brain can be transplanted into a live body at some point, even though I don't see how that's going to happen. But let's say we can do that. But there's also people who freeze their brain and then hope that all the information in the brain can be digitized at some point yeah. and put in a computer. Then they survive in a computer. I'm not sure I want to survive in a computer. Um, but that's what they want, and and they apparently consider the the, digi the information that's in their brain so valuable that that will be a good thing to do. Um, but and the reason I I wrote about that is that I'm not sure what you can feel without the body. So so can you create happy feelings in your brain without a body? Because all the feelings that we have, the most interesting one, like like anger and fear and happiness and love and so on, they're always reflected in the body. They, they relate to heart rate and temperature, voice timbre is in there. Um, everything connects with the body. And if you if you were to tell me that you were very emotional and you would say, but I didn't feel anything in my body, I would be very suspicious. That I don't think you can have a strong emotion without your body being involved. And so these people who freeze in their brains and then hope hope that it comes back into a computer format, I don't know what they're thinking, but I don't think they will be very happy under these circumstances. They, their brain may be doing something and there may be information in there that's valuable, but that's all I can say. Yeah, and, and, and if we follow that logic, so if we say that we, we definitely need our bodies to experience... Uh, the full range of, of, of life sort of in our emotions and everything. Um, I mean, when you look to your brain, it's obviously your brain has some sort of personality, right? And I was wondering, do you think that the body also has some kind of personality? So for example, if I would lose my arm and we would, for example, cut Elmer's arm off and put it, <laughs> sort of attach it to my body, would then my, also my personal, personality fundamentally change, do you think? Yeah, people have claimed that. People, people have really? claimed that if you, that if you get a heart transplant, uh, you, you're you're going to be like that person. So, so there, there are stories on this. I don't know what to do with them. I'm not, uh, I'm not in favor of that kind of stories. Uh, but but they exist. Yeah. Well, speculation almost. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's actually go back to a thing we were talking about earlier in the interview, which is tribalism. So humans obviously have the, the tendency to think sort of in terms of and form groups. So, for example, you have an interview or you have an example with uh, where they put, I think, around 10 boys in a house. And on day two, they already started to form groups on basis of in which room they sleep and on all sorts of different bases, which are actually not well, quite arbitrarily, actually. So we were wondering, how does tribalism actually work for apes compared to humans it's so interesting that we have two close relatives who are so different in that regard so the chimpanzees are very xenophobic and, and chimpanzees in the wild they have no friendly relationships between the groups as far as i know so the males are very hostile to other males and they try to kill them and they do kill them but bonobos are, are very different the bonobos are female dominated and uh, the females like to connect with females in other groups. They're, they're not hostile to them. They even share food and they play with the kids of females of other groups. And so they, they are very friendly with them. And the males of the bonobos, they are, they are still uh, territorial and they still get into fights sometimes, although they don't kill each other like the chimps. Um, 
course, they mix between groups and, and the chimps don't do that. And so bonobos are totally different and, and they're, they're exactly equally close to us, the bonobo and the chimp. The, the anthropologists and the psychologists in general prefer the chimp model. They always flock to the chimp because the chimp is male dominated and aggressive and it's not so sexy as the bonobo. They don't know what to do with all the sex of the bonobo. And so they, they flock to the, the chimpanzee and I always try to point out, we, they're exactly equally close to us genetically. There's no reason really to focus entirely on the chimpanzee, but that's what they like to do. But we all aspire for, I would say the majority of people I meet would rather live in a bonobo society than a chimp society, if I'm not mistaken, right? So even though these species are genetically similar, we're just as close, we do aspire, I think, more, on average, you can critique me if I'm wrong, but more for the morality and the moral system of the bonobo. How does that play into that? Women, women do. Men, 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 often, men are often very upset by the, I've, I've even had, interestingly enough, I gave a lecture in Germany one time and a very old German professor, it was about bonobos, a very old German professor stood up in the audience and said, what is wrong with those bonobos? And what, what, he, what he meant is that these males, they let themselves be dominated by the females. And so I think there are many men who okay, don't yeah. want to be bonobos. But, but for women, certainly the bonobo is a sort of, uh, light points because it shows that male dominance is not strictly necessary in in our close relatives. Okay, and actually to to end the uh, the interview, we wanted to ask a question about alpha males. So you often say that a real alpha male is not only uh, strong and dominant, but also helpful and and, and shows the most most uh, empathy actually of the whole group. So if we can see. Trump as actually just a macho and not a real alpha male. Which leader would be a real alpha female or male? Yes, interesting that Trump lacks those capacities. He he has the macho side of alpha male, so intimidation behavior and insulting others and being nasty to them. All these parts he has done down um, very well, but. Um, the empathy side and the unification side and keeping the peace side of the alpha male is apparently totally absent. And so it's, it's unfortunate that we have a leader who is not really a leader, um, who has only the, the bluff side of the alpha male. Uh, and, and at the moment, it's actually female leaders that we are looking at at the moment, uh, like in Germany yeah. and in New Zealand and so on. And, in my previous book, I, I made an error. I, I said female leaders, alpha females, good alpha females are always postmenopausal, uh, which is true for many. Which is true for many of them. It's true for Merkel. It's true for Golda Meir. It's true for Indira Gandhi and so on. Uh, so that was true. That was the the truth of uh, of the past. But now we have a lot of female leaders who are not postmenopausal, who are doing very well. And so um, that side of the leadership, the, the having empathy for others, unifying others, keeping the peace, that part is, is very well developed in some women uh, and is, of course, also develop, developed in some men. But unfortunately, at the moment in this country, we, we are missing a person like this. Yeah, and actually, I want to add one more question here because we were working on an interview in the past with Newt Gingrich and we actually ended up uh, setting up uh, we actually ask you a question about it. And Newt Gingrich uses chimpanzee politics to a certain extent to motivate his agenda. Do you think he's uh, reading your book wrong? Well, Newt Gingrich is a local politician here. Yeah. <laughs> he's in Atlanta. And we, we also have uh, Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And the funny thing is that um, Jimmy Carter re read my book, Peacemaking Among Primates. And Newt Gingrich read Chimpanzee yeah, Politics. Yeah. I've always said they should have swapped books. Yeah. Gingrich should have read Peacemaking, and and Carter should have read the politics part. Um, but yeah, they uh, Gingrich um, is is at the root of our partisan problems here exactly. in the U.S. Yeah, he he's really at the basis of that, and he's now he has been phased out to some degree out of politics. But yeah, he's he was at the root of that. Maybe you should send him a copy of Peacemaking. I'm, I'm sure he'll appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> really though. No, he uh, he's used that uh, kind of uh, the primal nature of politics. I remember there was an Atlantic article, and he was talking about how it's all you know nature. We're all in competition for power. It makes yeah, you wonder. Yeah. It makes you wonder how much yeah. that influences behavior. But I think we'll wrap up today. If we're we will, we're we're done with everything. Mm.